Good afternoon and welcome to our worship service today. I hope you've all had a good week um, and that there's been many victories and looking forward to seeing everyone uh, for communion and fellowship later on after the service. Uh, we've got some songs lined up here, um, Be Thou My Vision, uh, Be Still My Soul, a song called Purify Me and a take on O Flower of Scotland called O Rose of Sharon, um, which has never been heard before by anyone because uh, I wrote it. So there you go. Um, but before any of that, um, Rochelle's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us. We thank you for just everything. We thank you for the the ability to come together even though we're meant to be so far apart and we thank you for yeah like um, Scott said for, for the victories that we've had this week we also thank you for the challenges because we know that suffering makes us stronger it gives, it gives us character and if we persevere with you and, and endure with your strength then we become the people that you want us to be we thank you for everything you give us we thank you if it's sunny today, that's fantastic. If it's rainy today, that's good because we need the flowers and we need the, the trees and we need them nourished. And as you nourish them, please just nourish us as well and let us hear the words that um, come through the sermon and the scriptures today and, and let them speak to our hearts and, and change us into who you want us to be. We thank you for everything. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
next song we're going to sing is Be Still My Soul. next one's a song called Purify Me. Um, I'm not sure if it's one that the ICOC generally sings, um, but it's it's one that we remember from youth weekends and summer camps and stuff. It's a good song. Mm -hmm. um, I've changed the words, um, added more verses and, and stuff, um, but no one's probably going to realise that if you've not heard it before. <laughs> so there you go. It's a brand new song. <laughs> Surrender all to you 
completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. That's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain, but now it is a worldwide project to send millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies. Toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church, bringing their boxes. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lives are being changed all over the world. It's brilliant. Welcome to the sermon portion of today's service. Today we're continuing our series on the heart of a disciple. And today we're going to talk about the eager heart of a disciple. Or perhaps as a different title, All In for a Walk with God. So point number one, All In for a Walk with God. If we read in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, it says, 
to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. It talks about how we're called to be holy people. Now when we're saved by faith and walk with God, we become like Abraham in Romans 4. Abraham left his past life in Ur of the Chaldeans behind. Actually, this is a biblical definition of forgiveness, being allowed to leave one's past life behind and leave it to become holy people. As Christians, some of us originally came here because we wanted to leave our past behind. Some came here because we found something by accident that turned out to be very special indeed. Something beyond the usual religion. Something that captured our hearts. The way of Jesus. In Matthew 13, 44, the Bible tells a brief parable of someone who found something very good by accident. That particular verse reads, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That a person found and hid. And because of joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. This man was all in, as you might say. He sold all he had. The treasure seemed to him to be worth it. There's a bit of a reflection of Abraham's life here. His finding this item changed the course of his life. Well, it must have done if he'd sold everything to get it. You'd sold everything you had to buy one thing. I think it would change the course of your life. It would mine. Of course it would. Welcome to the world of the one who is all in for a walk with God. Sometimes, the, sometimes they say that you can bet your bottom dollar. I just have this view when that, that phrase is used of James Bond at the Casino Royale in Montenegro with a big pile of chips stacked up to here and the Shifa raises him and Bond has to put all his chips in betting his bottom dollar and all the ones that are on top of it. At that point, in, in Texas Hold'em Poker anyway, you are all in. You're only allowed to not match your opponent's bet if you bet all your money. You can't do this very often. If you lose at this point, you're out the game and you have no chips. I spent my last dollar once. It was foolish. I spent it on a bottle of whiskey. That showed where my priorities were. This was a long time ago, fortunately. I'd never do that now. Well, I don't carry dollars anymore anyway. That was when I lived in Australia. But I wouldn't do it regardless. I guess it's fair to say that what we spend our last pound on shows what our priorities are. So point two, all in for your bottom dollar. Here's another story of someone who was all in. It's in Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. The story goes like this, with Paul and his companions coming to Europe for the first time. We put out to sea from Troas and sailed a straight course to Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in that district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We stayed in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the side of the river, where we thought there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began to speak to the women who had assembled there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, a God-fearing woman, listened to us. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptised, she urged us, If you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she persuaded us. Lydia was all in. Philippi was a Roman city, a great centre of trade and wealth. Lydia was a trader. She traded in purple cloth. This was a very fashionable thing at the time. The purple dye was known as Tyrian purple and manufactured in Phoenicia, an area around modern Lebanon. Maybe that's where 
Lydia became a worshipper of the Lord. It was a rich colour derived from sea snails and prized by rich people. National Geographic actually says, In antiquity, fabric production was the most labour-intensive of all crafts. It's hard to overstate its cultural, social and economic significance. Clothing not only offered people protection from the elements, but also denoted social status. Cloth was used to record events or stories in the form of tapestries, and it could even be of such value that it functioned as a form of currency. As we all know, if you sell high-end products to rich people, you generally become rich yourself. How many impoverished Jaguar salesmen do you know? So we can assume that Lydia was a wealthy person. With regard to Philippi, it seems that Philippi had no synagogue. Paul's pattern was to go to a new city and first look for the synagogue and preach to the Jews about Jesus. We're told that Paul went to the river to look for a place of prayer. Now this was a building uh, that followers of God built in cities where there was no synagogue. In order to have a synagogue, a city needed to have 12 married Jewish men. Uh, So clearly this was not the case in Philippi. Perhaps hence the women that met him at the place of prayer. A place of prayer would often be by a river so that ceremonial washings or baptisms could take place. In an ancient city, it was also where many people would gather to wash, collect water, do their laundry, and so on. Incidentally, this shows us uh, that the gospel really is for all. It's a nice irony that when Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia in verse 9 of this chapter, actually it turned out to be a woman. That, that kind of leads on a bit, you know, when, when we evangelise, what, what does God want us to look for? Are we looking for a particular person, somebody who we feel is the right kind of person, or are we just inviting people? Have you been giving out cards in September? I missed five days, mostly because I was away hiking with Sam. We did 57 miles of the Carroll Way, which was, which was really nice. At one point last month, I kept meeting Sikh men. That was quite interesting. Uh, There aren't that many of them in Glasgow, I don't think, but I conclude that this is who God wanted me to invite to church. That's great. One of them is a new neighbour of mine. Regardless, God opened Lydia's heart to respond to the message of Paul when Paul and his companions were sharing their faith. And Lydia's heart responded eagerly. She was all in. She had the eager heart of a disciple. She had the eager heart of a follower of Jesus. She wanted to know more, and she wanted to spend more time with the men who told her about her saviour. Here's the thing. Lydia was evidently a successful woman, as many people measure success. Yet she knew there was more to life than just this. Many people who have money become completely absorbed by it, even though they know that it doesn't make them happy. Yet Lydia yearned for more. There's something a bit humble about Lydia, even though she's wealthy and successful. She says, if you consider me to be a believer of the, in the Lord, there's something a little bit insecure about that. You know, maybe, maybe she just, maybe it's just her perspective or whatever. Uh, maybe she just sees the true size of her achievements in relation to the pearl that she's just found. Is this you? Do your friends respect your achievements but wonder... But you wonder, is there something more? Do you see that whatever you do in life, there will always be something missing? Do you see that there's a God-shaped hole in your heart, but somehow can't get close enough to God to fill it? We can be all in, but still missing something. 21st century life teaches us to be driven and think about high achievements like Lydia. But are we really able to leave our past behind? Be forgiven? Remember, that the true definition of forgiveness is being allowed to leave your past behind. When I left my past behind, the one that included buying whiskey with my last money, a lot of things went on the rubbish dump. Obvious sins like selfishness, alcohol addiction, sexual immorality, but also subtle things like chasing after the wind in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. Following pleasure and success for the sake of self-fulfilment, but not looking to God as the author of fulfilment and righteousness. Fortunately for me, I left this mediocrity behind. Uh, God helped me build a new life based on, uh, on a mission of following Jesus. Being all in has given me new dreams 
as well as a host of new experiences, meeting many interesting people with different backgrounds and worldviews, light years away from where I was before. I was blessed by being allowed to leave my past behind. I still struggle sometimes to control my temper with road rage. I get angry with little things. Even then, it's great to be able to leave my recent sins behind. Lydia invited the apostles back to her house. Why would you do that if you weren't all in? And you didn't want to leave the past behind. Let's go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13 and verse 45 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found a pearl of great value, he went out and sold everything he had and bought it. Here's a different man to the man before in Matthew 13. If we look carefully uh, with the the verse in, in verse 44 as well, we can see this man's different. Was he all in? Yes, absolutely. Was he more all or less all in than the man in verse 44 where it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that a person found and hid. Then because of joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Yes, he was, this, this, the second man was absolutely just as all in as the first man. This man was actually looking for the treasure. This man paid full market price for the pearl. The first man just acquired it by some kind of deceit. In these parables, who does the man represent? Well, actually, there are two different men. The first man is not looking for the pearls. The second man is. The first man deceives in order to get the prize. The second man, in honesty, pays full market price. But interestingly, both of them sold all they had. As we look more carefully at this, it becomes obvious that in the first parable, the man seems to represent the seeker or the person seeking God. In the second one, the man seems to represent God. That is, God seeking people for relationship. The pearl is our relationship or our friendship with God. God is the one who paid the full market price. That's to say Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus made a sacrifice of his life which paid for all of our sins. We are the one who obtained it by alternate means. Hiding the pearl again, going, buying the field. We didn't really pay full price for the relationship that we have with God. Jesus was the one who paid that. That's the good news of Christianity, by the way. So what does this tell us about God? It tells us that God is all in. God has that eager heart. And if God is all in, so should we be, like Lydia. This takes me to point three. Point three. All in because we can't go out now. Or all in but not in your home. In lockdown, it is not our home we should be inviting people to, but our emotional space. What is our emotional space? What do I mean by that? Well, giving and receiving emotion, giving love and joy to other people. Teen suicide is markedly higher during lockdown. Maybe all suicide is. Maybe teens don't cope so well, but even teens around here have committed suicide. It's very sad. People I know well have said, that they have been affected by this too. How can we give and receive emotion? Well, here are some examples from that I've seen myself. Perhaps helping a colleague who's been pushed around by their broadband supplier to push back against it. That can be helpful. Helping a brother or sister talk through an emotional issue. Talking to a new neighbour. Doing a good turn for a new neighbour. Like I said, I've I've met a new neighbour recently, which is nice. Uh, A chap who lives uh, just uh, up the road from us. I met him clearing over vegetation from a street corner. I need to think how I can get into his life and help him out. It was good to give out some cards in September, but why stop in October? These things can fit in with our lifestyle. I met a guy called Sam on a bike while I was cycling home from work tonight. 
and we had a nice long chat over several miles. Wide-ranging topics, but during that time, I invited him to church. He didn't want to come, but that's not the point. The all-in disciple is a prolific sower. Obviously, as Christians, we want people to respond to the gospel. But going back to Acts 16 and and verse 14, God opens Lydia's heart to respond to the gospel. That's all we can ask for. The response is their responsibility. It was still Lydia's responsibility to obey the gospel. God opened her heart to respond, and she decided to obey. So God can open people's hearts to respond. So let's pray for that. I appreciate the sisters moving to a more prayerful form of discipleship recently. We plan to come to that as a whole church in November. But how to be all in if we can't go out? Let's read your Bible and pray deeply. This is the beginning of many heroic walks with God. Don't underestimate the power of it. When we're at home, we can definitely do this. We can also encourage our others by sharing our Bible study and prayer times with them. We can give our special contribution. That's coming up this month, next month. We can give our special contribution in an all-in fashion, even if we're not going out. Also, we can give each other hope. Hope in the Bible is understanding that the cross of Jesus will redeem us at the judgment. Romans 5, in the first two verses, it says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Hope is all to do with salvation that we'll see and we'll receive. Psychologists repeatedly show that hope is an important contributor to good mental health. Acts 2.26 Acts 2.26 quotes Psalm 16 and says that my body will rest in hope. Hope has two close cousins, faith and love. If we look in Colossians 1, in verse 3, it says, We always give thanks to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray to you. Pray for you, sorry. We have, since we heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, your faith and love have arisen from the hope laid up for you in heaven, which you have heard about in the message of truth, the gospel. Belief that God can do good things is so important. God opened Lydia's heart to be receptive to the message. Therefore, there was both an input from God and from Lydia and Paul and his companions to Lydia's conversion. We can pray for each other's faith to be enlarged. We'll talk about pray more in November. And kudos for the sisters to really really get going in that area right now. But above all things, put on love. Colossians 3.13 says, 3.14, beg your pardon, says, And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. These things are all ways in which we can be all in, but not have others in our homes. Hospitality, etymologically speaking, means to entertain strangers. We can do that over the internet, somewhat. If you're watching and thinking about joining us on Zoom, please do. If you used to come to church, please come and join us on Zoom afterwards. Faith and hope and love are team pursuits in many ways. Come and feel the love and faith and hope. Let's have the eager heart of a disciple. Let's be all in for God. The kingdom of God is like a pearl that is worth paying all the money you have for. It's worth betting your bottom dollar on. Lydia was all in. In fact, Many of the characters of the New Testament and the early church were all in. They weren't afraid to spend a lot of time around the disciples. Let's try and spend a lot of time around each other. God is all in for his relationship with us. Why should we give back any less in the way we respond to him? And let's be all in when we're all in the house. This requires creativity, but start with prayer and Bible study and see where it goes. Take some action too. Encourage others in faith and hope and love. I hope this has been helpful and encouraged you to have the eager heart of a disciple. Let's be all in for God and to God be the glory. Amen. 
The last song that we're going to sing uh, before we sign off of here and sign on to Zoom for communion is O oh, Rose of Sharon. So this is O'Flora of Scotland um, and I've changed the words to be about Jesus. Um, so it's a, it's a hero ballad uh, for our king. Say